So Habitat for Humanity, um, they do such amazing work all over the country. Um, It's really great to have you here in the Portland area, zooming in at least for their big gala. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're going to say to the people who are watching? Yeah, you know, the the topic of my speech is just all about the importance of home. And I think it's something the folks from Habitat for Humanity know so well. Um, We know it emotionally. uh, And I think there's just a ton of data to support the fact that home is a stabilizing agent. You really can't expect people to be healthy uh, across a number of different categories, whether it's mental health, whether it's physical health, you can't expect children to do well in school. You can't expect people to sort of start their their futures and grow any kind of stability without home. It makes a lot of emotional sense, but now we know there's just tons of data. And of course, right now, um, this week we did a story on it for our show, a matter of fact, that looked at the number, the record number of evictions uh, that are happening currently uh, now that the eviction moratorium is over. And so it's just a devastating time um, for people who have struggled uh, to pay their rent and who will just continue to be more destabilized. My, um, where I live in Florida, my, my next door neighbor um, is, it has a Habitat for Humanity home and, um, and it was built by Jimmy Carter. He actually uh, came in and, and built the home with his hands. And so, I mean, it's like one of those little things where you take people around the neighborhood, you brag about, <laughs> here's my neighbor's house, Jimmy Carter helped build it. But I think that he's such a great um, face of the organization, right? Which is, mm-hmm understanding that people need homes and they need a home they can afford and they need a home in order to have stability. And in a time when we are so polarized about almost everything, Habitat for Humanity walks the walk. This is something everybody can get behind, right? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you know, it's funny, I think we're polarized on a handful of big things, but I don't, I think we're actually, there's lots of things we're not polarized on. Like when you go and you talk to, I mean, you do this because you you talk to people in your community and you realize whoever you're talking to, you're like, huh, that sounds really familiar to what somebody who might not think they're like you is saying, right? There's all these areas where we actually overlap a lot in how we feel. And I think especially when it's undergirded by data, there's no one who thinks, listen, being unhoused is totally great and a good way to get a a strong start in life. No one, there's not a soul who thinks that. People might have different approaches, but they all uh, agree with what the data clearly shows. So yeah, you're, you're exactly right. This is something that I think anybody who cares about trying to make sure that people in your community have stability and then can take advantage of all the other things that, that we're you know, lucky to have in this country, a free public education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's a great starting place. You mentioned Matter of Fact, the show that you host, um, Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel, and your credits are way too long to list, but you're so involved in so many things. For your fans who are going to be seeing this interview, can you give us a little peek about some of the things that you're working on? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for asking. Yeah, we are just putting the finishing touches on the very first documentary that's ever been done on Rosa Parks, which is crazy, right? I actually had to, I was like, that can't be true, but it is. No one's ever done a doc on Rosa Parks. Our doc is for uh, Peacock uh, streaming services, uh, but we've been invited to... um, to do a premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival. So we're pretty excited about that. I think that's in June. So we're working on that right this moment. A matter of fact, of course, is our weekly show. And, you know, and again, I, I think what we try to do on that show is not so much focus on the bold face names of, of what's happening in the world, but people who are trying to figure out how policy is going to affect them. So we do a lot on homelessness and understanding the job market and understanding um, what's happening across housing generally and understanding what's happening in policy around COVID. Uh, So we were just doing, we do a lot of stories around housing because obviously that's clearly a huge uh, issue right now in this country. And then Real Sports, I head off to Texas uh, to do uh, a piece, a, a fantastic Real Sports piece Real sports, we don't talk about them till they're just about to air. So I can't even <laughs> tell you what it's about, but it's really, really good. And we've been nominated for an Emmy Award for one of our stories on a um, on a great uh, Ukrainian um, Paralympian named Oksana Masters. Um, she uh, she was adopted by an American woman, so she competes as an American, but her heart is truly in Ukraine. So we have uh, been working on a story with her as well. So busy. That just sounds crazy busy, doesn't it? I'm just busy. Yes, it does. Busy. Yes, busy. it does. All good. Thank God, right? All good. No complaints. Okay, that's career. 
um, but you're also a mom. And I've got to ask you with Mother's Day coming up, um, what is the best thing that you think you've taught your kids? And (sighs) what's the best thing that they've taught you? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I think... um, I think the best thing you can teach your kids, which I think I've taught my kids, is about being a, a good person and being helpful to people who are struggling, you know, and being that one who who jumps in. I think it's very easy to kind of wait and see what other people are doing. And I, I've always really appreciated that they are, you know, they're, they're jumper inners. They, they kind of jump in and try to help out, which I, I love. And we were very intentional about teaching that. Uh, I think what I learned was really interesting. You know, I have four kids and... Um, I was just such a different student than all four of my kids. And, um, and so I used to get very frustrated when it was like, you know, your learning style is not my learning style. And I think as a parent, it's very helpful to learn, like everybody has their style and the best thing you could teach your kid or have them help you learn as a parent is like, they need to crack the code of their own style and how to leverage that the best. So I've really come away with that with, understanding yourself, like the greatest thing you can do, the advice I now give, we send a bunch of young women off to college. And I'm always like, understand yourself. Like, are you a morning person? Are you a late person? Are you a, uh, do you, do you, are you a procrastinator? Are you someone who's sloppy in the, you know, all those things will give you insight into how to, how to do a great job. If you're, if your first draft is always sloppy, great, get it on paper, but no, you need to do four drafts before you turn it in, right? Like just knowing these little secrets about yourself and tricks will help you be very successful. And, and so I, I think I've moved away from like, why is your learning style not mine? And into, okay, so this is your learning style. What do you have to do now to be successful in school, in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and, and life? That was a very good lesson, I think. Oh, I agree 100% everything that you just said. I think it's a, a bit of a trick of the universe to give you children that are nothing like you are, because that is a humbling, teachable moment. I totally agree. Um, And then you hear yourself saying something exactly like your own mother said. Yes. What do I tell you? And you're like, oh, gosh, what have I I become? It's happening. It's happening. No, I totally relate. Um, You know, I have to admit that when I told several people that we were going to be chatting, the first thing, no joke, that they said, I love Soledad O'Brien. Um, you are such a role model. Oh, my director's back there going like this. <laughs> He's like, yes, yes, me too. You're That's such so a sweet. role model for so many people. Um, can you give us a few words of wisdom about the best thing about being in your 50s? Because I feel like you've just gotten better and better and better with each decade. Being in your 50s is amazing. It's a bummer body wise, because like you, you trip over something and all of a sudden you've torn your ACL or you, you know, you're for no reason you wake up, you're like, I think I threw my back out and you haven't done anything. So that part's a bummer. But, um, I think what ends up happening is you become very much more centered around who you want to be around and what you want to accomplish. I was listening to Jamie Lee Curtis the other day. I think she was on maybe Oprah's show. I forget. And she was talking about how she realized like there was a ticking clock and she's 60 and she's like, there's all these things I wanted to do. So she's got, I think four movies in production and she started writing, you know, and I thought, I felt the same way. Like now is the time. So, you know, I love horseback riding. So I've really upped doing that so that I'm really at a good level where I can start competing more. Um, You know, my kids are getting older. So as they head out the door, I want to make sure the things that, that I want to do, we up, upsized, I would say a little bit. We we live downtown and we just moved up to Harlem um, and we want to be very involved in the community. And so we've kind of opened up our house to events. You know, we have a, like a good living room uh, in order to host events because I said to my husband, like, if we're in a community, I want to be in a community. So we have a in the next couple of weeks, a number of black female um, executives uh, and young women who are interested in becoming uh, business executives are going to meet and do like speed dating <laughs> in the living room. Um, you know, and so I sort of feel like if you're here, how, how are you useful? How are you using the space that you have? How are you using the resources that you have? And I think at 50, for me, at least, I'm less worried about, did I get invited to this thing? Am I doing that? And, you know, and much more like, oh, I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to <laughs> I want to just sit in my pajamas and do what I want to do, but make sure that anything I'm doing is, is a little more useful. You mentioned horseback riding. Are there other things that you do when you just need to really 
unplug and have fun? Not a lot because I don't unplug and have fun a lot. Unfortunately, I mean, running, uh, you know, running a business and we, we were basically, we serve a lot of masters in a lot of ways. We run, do a show, we do a radio show, we do real sports. So I'm traveling a ton for kids, watch a lot of lacrosse uh, for my boys. Um, So no, I would say my main thing is horseback riding, although I'm in here now with my hair. Pandemic puppy, that's Coco and Teddy's kind of. That's Teddy down there. I don't know if you can see him at all. I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, I've really, uh, no, I would say horseback riding is my main thing of just, I love horseback riding. And I, I didn't really start it till I was, you know, 40 um, and just did a little bit at a time because you can't focus on anything else. You can't make lists in your head. You can't, um, you know, or you'll die. <laughs> you can't, uh, you know, do phone calls and text other people. And, do, you know, you literally have to just focus on riding. And so I find it mentally really helpful as a break. And then it's a great sport. So um, I've really, really enjoyed it. But no, I, I don't at this moment. I think when everybody goes off to college, maybe I'll have a little more time. Um, but right now I'm still driving people, you know, uh, around to, to practices and, and um, travel sports, et cetera, et cetera. How old are your kids now? My boys are 17. So they just got their licenses. So now is the time. If you were thinking about leaving driving, (laughs) this is the moment. (laughs) Uh, No, they're good drivers. And my old girls are uh, 20 and 21. So they're close. They're close to being, you know, the girls are pretty much off doing their thing and the the boys are getting there. And then I think, you know, it's good to make sure that you have a lot of interests and things that, that engage you in your own community um, once your kids go off. And also I think it's a good model for them. I think, you know, I've always really liked uh, being a working mom as a model for my kids and being a mom who's very involved in, in charity in some capacity uh, as a good model for the kids. I think, I think for me, that was important. You know, as I listen to you talk, I also think about the fact that um, you're nonstop. So that is stressful. Even when you love what you do, that's stressful. Um, how do you deal with that kind of transition and what do you do to kind of cope with all the things, all the balls in the air when you're working mm. and going back and forth between family? Such a great question. I feel like this is we, like, we should be having a glass of wine and <laughs> having this conversation. <laughs> like, how do you do it? I don't know. How do you do it? <laughs> We're um, looking for advice. Know, <laughs> right? I, I don't do it very well. And I don't think I have very many girlfriends who do it very well, to be honest. I think we're all successful because we juggle a lot. And then I think we're exhausted because we juggle a lot. Um, But I have every year, and this year is no um, exception, I try to come up with my list of like, well, this year, here's how we're going to, you know, here's how we're going to try to manage better. So for example, my um, uh, one year I removed, I used to have cooking, learn how to cook on my list every year. And then one day I'm like, I hate cooking. You know what? Let's just kill this off the list. Like I never felt better. I was like, I will not learn to cook. I live in New York City. I absolutely can just run to the corner and get something to eat. I don't need to know how to cook. Uh, There's enough. My daughter's a great cook. All good. Um, So one, I think removing stuff off this fake list that you've made in your head of what you think, you know, as opposed to stuff that you enjoy and you want to get done. And then I think starting to protect better. For example, in my calendar now, I literally block out writing because it's important to me. Mm -hmm. And it's like it literally this time in my calendar is not available. I will work till 10 o'clock at night if I have to. Last night I was doing phone calls late, you know, but, but, you know, this is the thing that's important because I found, and I find a lot of women do this actually. Um, we sort of cave like, oh, you know, no, no, you could, yes. Okay. I'll do that. I'll go in, I'll do this. And I remember one year when my daughter was very little, she was sick. She had a stomach bug sick as a dog all night. She was up, you know, and first thing in the morning, my husband gets up and, start, and he and I were both up with her at various stages um, in the morning, we get up and he, he gets up and he's going off to the gym. And I'm, meanwhile, I'm like canceling things left and right. He's like, she's fine. I need to go to like, to make myself happy. I need to go to the gym. Like, that's what I need to start my day. And I really kind of admired this idea of, you know, I'm just going to sit here and watch this child. She was not an infant. She was probably four or five years old. Um, and it was, it, it, there's a certain, the right word is not selfishness, but like, protective of self where you have to say, no, actually, this is important to me. He's like, we both do not need to watch his job. So if you're saying I'm going to the gym and I, it was such a great lesson to me because I realized that he's very good at protecting the stuff that matters to him. And I'm, I'm less good. If something matters to me and someone calls up and says, oh, you know, we have a problem. We have, you know, I'll, I'll cave immediately and cancel the stuff that matters to me. 
And then one day you'll look up and see like, oh my gosh, I haven't done, this thing is so important to me and I just haven't done it. So I started putting in my calendar, just blocks of time and, and blocks of time, like eat lunch, block of time. You know, like, so I can, if I want to, I can sit down and have lunch and I don't have to be, oh, while I'm eating lunch, I'm also texting three people on a conference call and, you know, and doing something, you know, like, which is sort of my style. So I'm trying every year. I think I get a little bit better and a little bit closer to that, but I think it starts with removing the stuff you really don't want to do. You know, I, I don't need to be here. No one needs to have me cook. I can, I'm a very good microwaver. I can make <laughs> gravy. So my job at the at Thanksgiving is gravy. That's all I need to do. You know what? I appreciate you sharing that because I know people, women especially, will hear and see themselves in the stories that you're telling. And it does. It kind of even makes me feel like better. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's it. It really is all of us. It's not just it's just not me or whoever. Yeah. So that's super helpful. Um, what else was I thinking of as you were talking there? Oh. I think the thing that helped me, I'm a little bit older than you are. My oldest is 29. My youngest is 23. Um, but one of the things that helped me the most is um, really realizing that the dream, I guess, I had or the misconception I had in my 20s, maybe, or as a teenager, like, I'm going to be happy when. And mm. there is really never a there there. Of course, you're happy. But every other emotion will also materialize over and over again as you live life. That's the human journey, right? Does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. I think Oprah has talked about that. I mean, I sound like I'm, I'm, I'm waking up every morning and channeling my inner Oprah, <laughs> but I think she's talked a lot about this idea of like, you know, if I could just lose 30 pounds and I'd be, if I could just get this done, if I could just move here, if I could just, you know, date this person, you know, and, and I think it's sort of this idea that life starts once you hit that thing versus life is what's happening around you all those times and all those moments. So yeah, I, I think that's really, really true. And it's why, again, I think it's Jamie Lee Curtis's idea, like there's a clock that's ticking. And if there's stuff that you want to get done, now is the moment to do it. And maybe, maybe write down. I was in, I was in Madrid the other day and I, you know, my mom was Cuban and my Spanish, I've been more or less fluent at different times in my life, but I now speak very solid Spanglish. And just walking around Madrid, I was visiting a girlfriend, my sister and I, and I was like, I want to be fluent in Spanish. Like that's on my list. And so at some point, not soon, but in you know, maybe five years, I will go to Madrid for a month or two months and really take an intensive Spanish class so that I like that's now on my list of something that I want to accomplish. And then you have to kind of figure out, well, where does it fit in? I have kids in high school, so clearly not this moment, but but, you know, at some point down the road. I want to be able to to accomplish that. And so I, I think you're right. It's like, but life is now, you know, now put it on your list and make sure that you shoehorn it in where it needs to go and that it's something that you want to do versus things that have been that you think are the right thing to do. Things that you think, you know, um, you know, everybody should be able to do this. I should be able to do this. OK, I promise I won't keep you too much longer, but there are a couple of things that I want to touch on um, because we really have been through it. Um, the last two years plus with the pandemic and, you know, social justice and racial justice. And I honestly, some of the things that happened after George, George Floyd's death in uh, May of 2020, I don't think I really ever thought that I would see because I was just so small during the civil rights movement. Like that is not right. a memory to me. Um, but you and I are both from interracial families. My mother was white. My dad was black. Your mother was Afro-Cuban. Your father is Australian. Um, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of what you've seen growing up um, as a biracial child and um, perhaps what you're seeing now for children who are biracial and just kind of the change in tone in many ways. Um, I do feel yeah, like just, we've made some really great progress. We but. have just because of the numbers, right? The numbers mm -hmm. have just grown tremendously. So, I mean, there was a time, uh, and I think you and I were at the cusp of that time when being a biracial kid was, a, depending on where you lived, was quite a bit of an oddity, mm -hmm. you know, so that people would literally stop and stare at you. I saw, I was talking to my sister two days ago, and my parents passed away a couple of years ago and she was going through their papers and she was sending to each sibling our original birth certificates because my mom and dad had them. And she said, you know, the most interesting thing 
because she and my older sister were born in Baltimore, 1960, 1961, dad's race was Negro on the birth certificate. They lied on their birth certificate wow. to make because, isn't that amazing? So everybody else, my dad was white and very white. <laughs> like if you saw him, you'd be like, he's white. Um, I thought that was really incredible and really speaks to the time that they lived in to make sure they weren't getting in any kind of trouble. It was just easier. And back then dads weren't allowed in the delivery room, right? So it was just easier to say, um, you know, Negro father. Um, so number one, the numbers have just changed. You know, being biracial is not sort of some oddity. I mean, we know that the number of kids who are born into interracial families um, is has grown significantly. And I also think there are lots of conversations around it now where people really talk about their experiences. But of course, depending on where you grow up is going to really shape how that experience, you know, kind of plays out. But at the same time, you know, as you know, there's that, I think it's in Michigan, a state guy who's running for the state Senate who's, you know, who's, whose platform is I'm a white guy with a white wife with white children. And I believe white people should marry each other. And I'm against interracial. And, you know, that when those things happen, it is a little bit of uh, I just can't believe we're here having these conversations with a person who's, you know, getting media attention because he's a viable state Senate candidate. Um, I find that really sad and disturbing and troubling. Um, but I think for your average kid who's growing up today, the world is a really different place my parents used to my mom used to talk about how people would spit on her Ooh. and her kids when they would in Baltimore when they would walk down the street in the 1960s you know that obviously has changed dramatically but you know this country has never really figured out all the challenges we have around race and I think we're circling back around to a time where uh, there's been a lot of pushback and a lot of anger and a lot of the Wall Street Journal had a story about a young woman who couldn't get into Ivy Leagues even though she had a 1550 on her SATs and the you know the real culprit, right, is the Black students who um, who get in on their, their GPA versus all the other legacies. I mean, anybody who goes to an Ivy League school knows, boy, if your dad went, you're much more likely to get in. Um, uh, there was a new columnist for the New York Times who wrote about how as a white woman, you know, why is she not allowed to write about other people? Why does she, you know, and why does lived experience, right? So we're in a moment where, you know, no one has said she can't write about other people. No one has said that this woman's position was stolen from by some person of color, but their implication certainly is there. So, you know, we're in a crazy time, right? Where I feel like we've had those conversations and we're circling back around to have them again, uh, because often in politics, you know, race is a really useful lever for people to feel like something is being done unto them. And uh, and that's where we are again. So it's 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 a very sad time too. Are you hopeful all with all that said how do you feel moving forward what is your kind of frame of mind as you kind of look at all the myriad issues you know i my probably my biggest strength slash weakness is i'm a nauseatingly hopeful person i am <laughs> i am a per, anytime something bad is out like i'm the person you want next to you because i'll always be like well, I feel like the silver lining in all of this. <laughs> you know, I'm that girl who's always, you know, I feel there's an upside to this conversation. Uh, so, um, yeah, I am hopeful because I'm I'm just nauseatingly hopeful. I think that people come through things and people figure things out. I've been disappointed sometimes in the amount of, um, of press. Oh, I guess the other thing that happened was, I think it was the New York Times, maybe magazine did a, a glowing profile on um, Christopher Rufo, who's the guy who really brought up about conversations around critical race theory. And now he's going on to attack, um, you know, gay and trans kids. And, and it was done in a very, um, well, you know, what we call the hero shot, right? Like the, the beautiful shot of him in the, in, the, in the paper, you know, so all those things are very troubling. Um, but I am optimistic because I think there's always a new generation that pushes back. I think, you know, historically we've seen, um, you know, my people, my parents were spit on and, and, and you know, a generation later, you know, that would just be insane and not happen where I live, at least. So I, I'm, I am incredibly hopeful. And I think there's a lot of young people who, who are very, when I went to high school, if there was a kid who was gay, that kid would be teased mercilessly, mm -hmm. just because and that's how it was in the 1970s and 80s in my high school, and my middle school. Um, in my kids high school, that would never happen. It would just be so unusual. And I, I get that, you know, we're different locations, but still, like, that's a lot of progress that has happened in one generation um, where people have just completely shifted how they feel about things. And so I, I am eternally hopeful uh, in how things will turn out because I think young people are really quite incredible. 
Is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have either about Habitat or um, any of the things that we've discussed? Yeah, I think the only thing I would say about Habitat is I, I run a small foundation. We send girls to and through college. And I often will have people who say to me, I don't know how to get involved. You know, I don't I don't know how to get in. Uh, I can't take on a, a mentee full time. I'm too busy. I can't write a big giant check. Uh, you know, and I always tell people, like, figure out what you can do. And I think the same thing for Habitat for Humanity, right? There's there's so many ways to be helpful. Um, there's so many ways to be involved. And it doesn't involve, you know, whipping out your checkbook and writing a giant check. That would be nice. I'm sure they would say, fantastic, send money. But also helping people, helping people learn a trade, helping people who are trying to figure out how to navigate the system. There's so many ways in um, to be helpful, whether it's over a year or over a weekend or over a day. There's so many ways. So I would just encourage anybody who feels inspired by the work that people uh, for ha that Habitat for Humanity uh, are, are doing day in and day out. Get involved, even if it's just a little tiny bit. Bring your kids and, and, and learn what they do in your community and then see what you can do to help kind of grow that in the community as well. That is the perfect note to end on. Um, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you for Pleasure supporting Habitat. Mine. Yes, um, we'll be watching on Wednesday. Thank you. Can't wait. Thank you.